my name's Anthony Spinner, better known as Tony Spinner. This is my story, if you like, on my treatment for cancer over the last two and a half years. Um, if you're interested, you watch it. If you're not, you won't. Um, two and a half years ago, roughly, I went to my doctors, my GP, with um, stomach problems, and um, he put me on to Gaviscon, which I took for about a month. Didn't really help. Went back to see him. Uh, explained to him that I was still having all these problems, weren't feeling very well. And he then put me on to Amoprazole. Amo so I'm being prompted by someone because I can't remember the names. Amoprazole, which I took for, again, probably about a month. Didn't seem to well. Went back to see him and said to him, look, this doesn't seem to be working and can these give you migraines? Because I I'm, I'm seem to be getting migraines. He went, oh yeah, um, we'll change them. So that was then changed to Lanzoprazole, which I'm still on, but um, didn't help with the stomach problems, um, helped with the headache problems. Um, was on them for a couple of months, went back to see him and no, I didn't actually, I'm lying to you there. I was on, to, on them for a couple of months and I went out for a meal. And whilst we was out for a meal, um, I swallowed something, can't remember exactly what it was, but it seemed to get stuck. And it then gave me an attack like, eat cups, only a hundred times worse. So now you can't breathe, you can't swallow, you can't do anything, you've got this And so I've had to get out of the restaurant. My um, friends brought me out a glass of water and I'm looking at this and thinking to myself, I don't quite know where to go here because I, I feel ill. I don't know how to get rid of this, whatever it is. I'm gonna to have to try and make myself drink water, which I, I took a mouthful of water, swallowed it. And it was so painful. It was like swallowing a golf ball. But it worked, which was the upside to it. Um, obviously, I didn't want anything else to eat. We went home. I went back to the doctors the next day and explained to him what had happened. And he said to me, uh, well, I think it's now time that you went over to the hospital and we do further investigations, one of them being a camera down the throat to um, see just what the problem is here. So I went, yeah, okay, thinking, uh, yeah, I really fancy that, not. But anyway, we goes over to the hospital, had some tests done. I've now got to go and have this camera down the throat. Gets to the unit, which is called... Uh, uh, it was the... Gastroenterology department. Gastroenterology, or something like that. And um, I goes in there, uh, talking to the nurse. We go through into where, not where they're gonna do the camera bit, but just outside. And we have to fill in pages and pages and pages of paper, um, which obviously we all had to do, I did all that. And they said, right, now, because of previous health problems, we can't knock you out. You're gonna to have to have this awake. And I went, great. So they said, well, you know. So anyway, I goes in, they sit me on what would effectively be the bed, and um, say to me, right, we have to spray your throat with this um, spray, which tastes of bananas, and um, it would help deaden the sensation with the camera going down your throat. Well, yeah, I'll have that. So they spray this stuff down your throat, which makes you gag anyway, because you've got this long straw thing that goes down your throat. Well, if that was bananas, I've never had a banana in all my life, I've got to tell you. That has got to be the worst tasting banana I've ever had. But anyway, had it done. Then they come over to you and they say to me, right, um, we need to put this 
guarding. So you put what effectively looks like a gum shield with an hole in the middle in your mouth, bite on that, and the camera is going to go down the centre of this shield. <clears throat> in comes the specialist or the cameraman with what effectively looks like a guard nose, but I now know it's the camera and goes, right, well, this has got to go down. You have to lay on your side, so you lay on your side. And in they start feeding this camera. It is not pleasant. Not by a long chalk is it pleasant. But going down is bad enough. Right up until they say, right, he's got to come back a bit. That's the bit where you start the gagging. But anyway, the... the They've gone in, I don't know how far, but far enough, obviously. And this guy then gets hold of this camera, like, left hand hold one bit, right hand holds the other, and they start turning it like a 1945 cranking handle. So you can feel it turning around inside you, which is weird. Um, the guy that's behind me, who's on a screen, watching what's going on, he's instructing the cameraman what to do, take it out 10 centimetres, 20 centimetres, go right, go left. As they pull it out, I've got to tell you, you cannot do anything but gag. And so I'm gagging and um, the guy puts his hand on my shoulder and says, just breathe. I felt like punching him. Well, I'm trying to breathe. Um, but anyway, that all done, the guy who's on the screen says right we need to take biopsies and I'm thinking uh oh don't like the sound of this so the cameraman puts a fluid down the centre of the camera there's obviously an hole down the middle of it and you can feel it all gush around inside you and then they start feeding down what I can only presume is like scissors and go down to bring out these biopsies and all you can hear then is open, close, and then he brings it out and then take it back 10 centimetres, bit, open, close. Anyway, they took about six biopsies. Guy, um, when it's all over, he says, right, we're going to take the camera out. And I'm thinking, good, and he took it out. I'll stop gagging. The guy who was on the screen behind me come over and he said to me, right, uh, Mr. Spinney, you've got cancer. I said, yeah, I know. So he said, what do you mean you know? I said, I told my friend that before we come in. That's what this is because it's like nothing I've ever had before. That that's exactly what I expected it to be and you just confirmed it. And he said, well, this one is a particularly aggressive cancer so we're going to send you to the hospital in London to um, hear what they think of it. Right, so I'm now on my way up to London a couple of weeks later to see the surgical oncologist. Goes up there, meets the guy. He's got his screen in front of him, says to me, this uh, particular cancer is... Um, in your esophagus and it's a big operation. It is sort of 10 hours, maybe longer. And we've got to make you aware that you've got a 50% chance of dying on the table because of my previous ailments or a 20%, 30% chance of never being able to walk again if we get you around because of your problems, up to you what you want to do. I'd like you to think about it. I'd like you to go away and think about it and see what you want to do and, um, and let us know. So I've come away driving home thinking, a bit of Hobson's choice really, isn't it? You either have the op, perhaps die on the table, at least it's over with quickly, or try and fight this cancer and um, go through months and months and months and months of crap. 
I need more information because although you get loads and loads and loads and loads of information, it doesn't sink in. Uh, and I don't care who you are, you, you walk away and you just think, what does he say? And you forget a lot of where it started from. So anyway, I get home and I'm bombarded with appointments to all different places. One of them being the clinical oncologist. So our local, well, local, pretty much local to me. Um, so I go and see the clinical oncologist and we're now going to discuss everything that's happening at St Thomas's. Um, she explained to me that um, she wasn't really in favour of the operation because she's got patients that 18 months later are still trying to get over the operation. Don't worry about the cancer, the operation. So I'm thinking, mm, yeah, okay. And she said to me, um, you only had a 30% chance of actually getting over the cancer if I had the operation. Whereas that they could give me chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which would give me a 20% chance. So she'd like me to think about that. And I'm thinking 30%, 20%, I'd rather than not have the operation, just a 10% difference. So I decided I'm gonna go with the chemo and the radiotherapy. Um, and from there, um, I explained to her, that's what I was gonna do. And she was then gonna book me up for chemo uh, and radiotherapy, which obviously did happen. Right, so I'm gonna start the chemo in June, 2016. And I duly go there, I have my chemo infusion and at that time they then give you your tablets that you need to take, which are chemo tablets, don't really remember the name of them, but I have to take nine in the morning, nine at night, every day. Uh, three weeks later I have to go back for another infusion, another lot of tablets. This goes on for three months either way. Yeah. Um. Then you also get referred to, uh, you in between times you see the air, nose and throat. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry about that. In, bet in between all of this going on, I have to go and see the ear, nose and throat man, specialist, because I had, or well, they thought I had a problem with my, um, my throat or my glands in my throat. So I go along to see him. Um, he sticks camera up your nose, has a look around says to me, I, I can't actually see anything, but um, I would like you to come back. And he makes me another appointment. Um, and during this time, I'm having all this chemo going on. So it all gets a bit messy and it's hard to keep track of. And certainly hard to remember dates. But anyway, I go back to see him again, uh, camera up the nose again. Still can't see anything. So he then, wants to send me to have a scan. What's that scan? PET scan. No. Ultrasound. Ultrasound scan. Um, and maybe um, take some... Biopsies? Biopsies, maybe. But he wants them to have, this, have a look on this scan first and see what they can see. So, apart from having all the chemo, I'm now coming up and I'm having this scan done. And they scanned my throat and the guy said to me, I can't see anything. It looks all normal. So I'm thinking, touch. I might, he might have to stick this needle into me. And he said to me, um, I'm gonna check again. And he, he thorough inspection. He said, no, I can't see anything. I'm gonna write to your specialist and tell him that. I'm not gonna take any biopsies because there's no point um, and we'll see what comes back. So I escaped, gets out of the hospital, goes back and? Uh, you see the specialist again once you get the results back? Ear, nose and throat specialist? Yep. So 
So I'll go to see the Nuttons and throat specialist once he's got obviously his results back um, and says to me, look, they're clear and I can't see anything. Camera up my nose again. But I want you to have a scan before I discharge you off of my books so that I'm more than sure that everything's fine and I want everyone else to know that everything's fine so I'm going to book you a scan. And I went, yeah, fine, no problem. So that's what happened. Right, so everything's happening. I'm getting scans coming out my ears. I'm going to go and see all different people, which all gets really confusing, as I'm sure you appreciate. But I'm at this point now where they now want to I've gone back to see the oncology um, specialist who says that following my CT scan, everything looks stable, but because of the high risk, they want to give me more chemotherapy in the hopes that he's either going to get shot of it or certainly slow it down a lot, um, and then followed by radiotherapy. So I went, yeah, whatever. So I then embarked on another six, I think it was, uh, lots of this chemotherapy, which is the infusion and the tablets. <clears throat> believe it or believe it not, the tablets are getting on my nerves more than the infusion, because every day you've got to take them morning and night, and it takes the swallowing nine tablets at a throw. Bear in mind, I've got a swallowing problem, so I have to have the little tablets. That's why I'm having nine at a time. Um, but anyway, you've got to bear with it and you've got to have a go. So I've gone through now this six months of chemotherapy, which brought me up to September? Uh, yep, yeah, end of September. End of September. Um, and I'm now going to have the radiotherapy. So I go there, have all that done, get me tattoos, which they have to have to line you up on the table. And I'm gonna, now going to have five weeks every day of radiotherapy, which is, yeah, it's all right, a bit weird. Get shoved inside a big microwave and it all starts making silly noises and turn you inside out, upside down. And, but nevertheless, you bear in with it thinking, everyone's trying to help me here, got to go with this. And I complete the cycle of radiotherapy, which brings me up to just outside Christmas, of 17th, 20th of December. And I can actually eat my Christmas dinner, which made my year for me, to be honest. So we have all that done. I've then now got another lot of different appointments coming in. One of them being ear, nose and throat. Um, they want me to have this scan, so I've gone along for the scan. Not realizing that the scan he wants me to have is a PET scan. PET scans are intrusive. Um, it's sort of three hours it's you get loaded up with this chemical like weapon warfare warnings everywhere you can't use the toilets can't go near anyone but anyway i have this scan done come out obviously come on and then wait for another lot or another round of appointments to come in um, fully expecting it all to be well, not all right, but sort of stable. We're fighting a good fight. Um, the only thing is that in between all of this, you're left hanging. Basically, that's what happens. Um, I don't know what my next, what was my next round of? Uh, it wasn't. You had a follow up, you finished all your chemo. And you had a follow-up scan booked for March 2017 and then you saw the oncologist 
after that at the end of March. Right, sorry about that. Now, so <clears throat> in March, I go and see my oncologist who books me in another CT scan and I duly have the CT scan and I go back to see her and she says that everything appears to be stable. Um, everything's all right at the moment. I don't quite know where I went from there as far as treatment's concerned, but what I do know is I've now got to go and see Mr. Ian Nose and Throat in May, which I did do, who booked me in for another PET scan. Um, when I had the PET scan, went back to oncology the oncology then said hold on a minute it's not stable um, the original tumor that was in my esophagus is but it's gone to my liver lungs bones um, and there was nothing else they could really do for me other than giving me Give me palliative chemo. Sorry, palliative care, palliative chemo. Um, not exactly, well, that's it, but that's what it meant. Um, so I said, to her, right, okay. Um, went back again to see Mr. Ear, Nose, and Throat, who says to me, Your ear, nose, throat, they're all clear, so I'm discharging you. Yeah? And I'm thinking, that's great. Just one bit clear, the other bit ain't. Anyway, so then from that time onwards... You had another lot of chemo starting in June for another I, six sessions. I started another lot of chemo in June, which was six sessions. Um, I th I'm not sure, was that the new chemo or the old chemo? No, it's the old chemo. Right, um, so we, we did the six sessions, which is obviously over six months. All the tablets, all the infusions, all that. Went back again to see the specialist. After another CT scan. After another CT scan. And go on, what was that? It was still stable. And it was still stable, even though it weren't, but it is. And this is where it all gets really rather confusing because you walk out and you think, is it or isn't it stable? Is it me or is it them? But anyway, you've got to accept what they're saying to you, so... Out you come. You have another CT in October. So I have another CT scan in October. Which is progressing. And they then say to me, uh, no, it's not stable. It's progressed. It's this in your liver, your lungs, your bones, we can actually see it growing. We can measure it month on month. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change your chemo. I've got another one to try and see how this works. So you've got to bear in mind <coughs> that during all of this, I'm trying to relate this to my family, specifically my son. Um, I'm in a lot of pain. I'm getting more and more grumpy. I feel... Uh, not that I want to give up, but I feel that uh, is this really worth it? Because you come out and after chemo, you bleed. It makes you feel crap. And um, my son was on my case then about, <coughs> excuse me, alternative um, medicines and treatments. And, you know, if you watch the TV and... There's so many things that uh, eat pineapple juice or eat pineapple or drink pineapple juice or eat bananas and this cures cancer or you know if you listen to everything everything you eat and drink would cure it which obviously ain't true um, but the one overriding um, thing that kept coming up was about CBD oil and he kept on at me uh, about this CBD and I said to him well yeah but we can't get it over there and he went well there must be a way and he was backwards and forwards backwards and forwards <coughs> and one of his friends 
um, Steve and Steve you're going to know you are um, helped us in as much as they knew of a way of getting some CBD oil and trying it and I had a few weeks worth of it and, I, and believe it or believe it not I did actually feel better and I told the specialist oncologist that that's what I was going to do and she said well I've got loads of people on it um, and she didn't really know or certainly weren't going to say well it works or it don't work um, so we turned to Steve and Steve happened to know um, some people in America who are known as Warfighter and we've really asked them for help and they've been kind enough to help they've sent me one of their treatments and this is how it turned up my son brings it over to me and I opened it up and went wow and there's bottles it's all wrapped in uh, bubble wrap obviously so don't break but this is it and I'm supposed to have two drops under my tongue three times a day um, and see what happens. Now I've been on this a fortnight, today I think it is, and it's weird. When I say it's weird, I mean when I take it, I can feel where I had all this pain, I can feel like someone's in there having a little root around. Obviously they're not, but that's what it feels like. <coughs> and I actually feel better. I'm eating better. I've had a lot of trouble with um, this part, which I, I don't know whether it's a, another growth or what it is. I've had problems with the original site as far as eating is concerned because every now and again it will catch you so you're eating and all of a sudden you can't and you're uh, uh, uh. In the last fortnight, touch one whistle, that seems to have gone away. I I feel better in myself. Obviously, the chemo sensation I still get, the you know, I feel like shit. Work walk 20 feet and feel like you've been 10 times around a football field. And it truly does make you feel like that, and I never believed it, but it truly, truly does. And you're so zapped, and you can't concentrate, you can't remember things. I mean, we all do it, don't we? Walk into the kitchen and think, what am I doing in here, what did I come in for? Well, if you can imagine that 100 times worse, that's what chemo does to you. And you walk into a shop, and how embarrassing is it when you walk into the shop, knowing full well what you're gonna buy, go in there and go, uh, what was it? And you can't, you truly can't remember. And it's almost like you've got to go back home to find out what it was you wanted. But the NHS in England, whilst is a great institution, and the NHS, I'm going to explain a little bit for the American people that are going to see this, I hope, that it's our free... Um, National Health Service, which anyone and everyone can use if you're um, English or British or whatever. Although it appears that everyone uses it, don't know where they come from. But anyway, we won't get into that one. The fact is, the nurses, the doctors are great. I, they, obviously they, they've done their best or, or trying to help me and I really appreciate it. The management of the NHS is absolute crap. And if the management asked the patients for their spin on what's wrong with the NHS as far as from a patient's view, I'm sure they would look at it and think, yeah, well, we hadn't actually thought of that. There is so much time and money wasted. It is 
unbelievable. And I don't want to get on my orange box. But as just a normal person, I sit there sometimes and think, really? Do we really need to waste that money? He says, Joe, but they're also very caring people. And the nurses couldn't sing their praises loud enough. Or the doctors, or the specialists, obviously. All lumped together, brilliant. Warfighter, also brilliant. They're obviously trying to help me with some of their alternative treatment. And I'm grabbing it because my son, specifically my son, has got no faith in the chemo. And I've got to be honest with you, mine's waning fast. And because you feel so much, so shit on it, it's, there's got to be something better. And I've got a feeling, and I hope that this could be it. This is making me feel better without all the injections, the going up the hospital, the going back. Literally, I can do it all at home, which to me is has got to be so much cheaper than what it costs the NHS to stick needles in me, etc. Why it's not made available in this country? I know the screen's gone up loads of times and I'm just going to echo it. I will never know. Because if it helps, and I do say if it helps, it should be made available. It's got to be a fraction of the cost of what going through chemo is and all these CT scans. So it's a case now of waiting. I've just had another CT scan on the 6th, which was this last Friday, as you can see by my arms from the injections. Um, I won't know about the outcome of that till the 27th. And then I've got to make my mind up as to what it is, if anything, has helped me. My opinion is, if anything's helped me, it's going to be the warfighters treatment because I can actually feel that working. I don't know whether that's good working or bad working, but I feel it working when I take it. So I'm going to put another blog up here on the 27th and again monthly to let you know, specifically Warfighter and all their friends that have helped, to let you know what it is that's happening to me and how it's happening and how I feel about it. And hopefully that will also help any of you that are going to go through the same battle and believe it is a battle.